Am I the asshole for not picking up my daughter from a party after she broke my rules? Yes. New Year's Eve aftermath here. My daughter is 16 and was allowed to go to a New Year's Eve party by herself for the first time. We clearly defined rules beforehand. One, no drinking. Two, only stay at the house we agreed on. Three, home by 2 a.m. I thought my daughter should be grown enough to handle those rules, but apparently I was mistaken. At about 1.30, she called me to say her friends wanted to go to another party and she joined them. Now she said her friends had vanished and she was at a house party where she felt unsafe and wanted me to pick her up. Girl. She was at a quite remote place, so there's no way she would have been home by two. Also, she was clearly intoxicated. I believe in consequences, so I refused. I told her that this would be a learning experience and to try to figure out how to get home. I have thoughts, but I'm going to hold off. Okay. She's too old for rules, so she doesn't need any coddling anymore. She proceeded to argue, but I just ended the call and went to bed. The next morning, I woke up to several aggressive and threatening messages from my ex-wife, who had apparently agreed to pick her up instead, against the custody agreement. Daughter is staying with her and refusing to leave, also against the custody agreement. I don't believe there was any real danger and just had to show her the rules exist for a reason. My ex seems to think different. Am I the asshole? Yes, you're the asshole. And let me tell you why. There are a couple of reasons. First of all, the only thing that you taught your daughter that night is that when she feels like she's in danger, when she feels like she's unsafe, when she feels like she needs an adult, you're not the one to come to. She can't trust you in situations like that because all you're going to do is let her down. That's the only thing you taught her that night. She learned nothing about rules. She learned nothing about respecting your boundaries. She learned that when she is in need, she cannot call her father. <laughs> I'm so mad right now. At no point ever in any situation should a punishment for your child being to leave them in a situation where they feel unsafe. Never at any point. In fact, I have a story about this. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a true crime story, okay, about Leslie Mahaffey. June 15th, 1991. A funeral is being held for a boy named Chris Evans. He was killed in a car accident earlier in the week, and now all of his classmates from school, his extended family, and his friends were gathering to lay him to rest. Everyone is hugging one another, offering condolences, and giving out general comfort when someone says, hey, where's Leslie? Has anyone seen Leslie? Okay, let's rewind a little bit to the night before the funeral. All of Chris Evans' school friends had gathered for his wake and then went to a secluded spot in the woods to drink and continue to console each other. These are high school kids, so should they be drinking? Probably not. Should they be drinking in the woods? Also, probably not. But they're all together. They just went through this traumatic experience together. They needed time to console each other. Leslie was there with some of her close friends, and as the night winded down, those friends drove her home to drop her off. Now, Leslie had been warned many times about missing curfew. So much so that the lecture had basically been burned into her brain. But surely this was different. Surely this was an extenuating circumstance, okay? Her friend had just died. She attended his wake and then spent some time consoling and being consoled by her friends. Surely this was different. So when she got to her house and the side door was locked, she thinks to herself, wow. Okay, mom, you've made your point. But she was certain that the front door would be unlocked. So certain, in fact, that she waves her friends off before she even makes it to the door. She watches them drive off, and then she put her hand on the doorknob, and it doesn't turn. It's locked. Her parents had taken a stance. If you can't respect our house, if you can't respect our rules, then you can find another house to sleep in. So Leslie takes a deep breath, and she makes a decision to walk to the corner store. It's the middle of the night right now, okay? It is dark. She makes the decision to walk to the corner store and use the payphone to call one of her friends to see if she can spend the night over there. She's 14 at this time also, okay? 14. It's 1991, and I know people say that that was a different time, but how different could it have been, okay? She's 14, and it's the middle of the night. So 14-year-old Leslie walks to the corner store and uses the payphone to call her friend. It's 2 a.m., so the friend is like, is this a joke? You're calling my house in the middle of the night? You're going to wake up my whole family. No, you can't stay here. Get off my line. Leslie hangs up, takes another deep breath, and turns to head home. 
She's going to have to wake her mom up. She's going to have to get her mom out of bed to unlock the door and let her in. But she never makes it there. She never makes it home. And the decision to lock her out of her house, out of her safe space, to throw her into the middle of the night, into the darkness, that's the decision her parents made. That's the decision that they're going to have to live with for the rest of their lives. That's the last decision that they will ever make with regards to a living Leslie. June 14th, 1991, 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey is walking in the dark at 2 a.m. after being locked out of her house for missing curfew, and she crosses paths with a man named Paul Bernardo. Paul claims he was in the area to steal license plates or maybe to break into a couple houses. The reports are unclear. The story changes a lot. Either way, I'm not sure why he would have felt the need to tell her any of that at all, because what drew her in was a cigarette. He offered her a cigarette and then told her he'd left the matches in his car. And once they were close enough to his car, he wrapped his sweatshirt around her head and forced her in. He then took her to the home he shared with Carla Homolka. Side note, when I was researching this case, I had already had Carla's name written down, like, in my notes for another case. So, unbeknownst to me, Carla Homolka is actually a serial killer. We're going to cover her in later episodes. Anyway, Paul Bernardo takes Leslie to the house that he shares with Carla Homolka and they proceed to rape and torture her for 24 hours. Carla was a veterinarian, so she had access to multiple different drugs, including the sedatives that they would use on Leslie during the many assaults. According to Bernardo, it was actually the drugs that killed her. Their plan was to release her, but during the scouting mission to find the right place to release her, she unfortunately passed away. That's his story. Carla, however, claims that Bernardo actually strangled Leslie with an extension cord, not once, but twice, because the first time only resulted in a short period of unconsciousness and not death. In fact, there are a lot of aspects about this case that neither Carla nor Paul can agree on, but the one thing they can agree on is that they gave her a teddy bear to hold in between assaults. Oh, and that they needed to dismember her body in order to dispose of it. Leslie Mahaffey's dismembered body was found June 29th, 1991, in Lake Gibson, fully encased in cement. Both Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo were sentenced to time in prison. However, Carla was released in 2005 as part of a controversial plea deal. I promise we're going to talk about Carla and her crimes in a later episode. We have to because, girl. Following Carla's 2005 release, Paul made a public statement saying he always intended to release their victims. Victims. Okay, Leslie was not the only one. But Carla was worried that Leslie's blindfold had slipped and that she would be able to identify them. This is what Paul said. He's also appealed his life sentence multiple times, and each time the appeal has been denied. And more recently, he's been declared a dangerous offender, so he will likely never get out. So, yes, OP, back to the am I the asshole question. You are indeed the asshole. Not only did you leave your daughter in an unsafe place, you potentially put her in a position where she could be even more unsafe. If you get a call from your kid saying, I need you to pick me up, no matter what time of day it is, day or night, no matter what you are doing, you stop and you go get your kid. That is the only option. What an idiot. 